Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to say thank you to the organizers. It's really a pleasure to come here to listen to all of the other talks and to have the opportunity to present some of our work. Um, so today, mostly, I'll be talking about uh, microbes and metabolism and chronic metabolic diseases. And if there's time at the end, I'll talk just a little bit about uh, gut-brain uh, interactions, um, if there's some time for that. So when we think about the gut microbiome and how uh, uh, it's shaped, we know that many external forces, like antibiotics, lifestyle, diet, and hygiene, can all shape the microbes that we have within us. And when we think about antibiotics, I want us to already start thinking about antibiotics really as uh, uh, three different things. One, they can be uh, uh, perturbations to the ecosystem, so they can disrupt the ecosystem. Two, they are really important clinical therapies. And three, they can be really great tools uh, to be used in an experimental setting to really demonstrate whether or not the microbiome is implicated, because it gives us that opportunity to change the system and see what happens. And the extent of the change really depends on the dose and the duration, uh, how much we really expose to antibiotics. So that'll be kind of a theme through the work today. Now, we know we, when there are changes within the microbiome, that altered intestinal microbiota can uh, feed into chronic inflammatory diseases and also metabolic dysfunction. We know that um, microbes uh, perform a great number of uh, uh, tasks that change our basic physiology, so they can change behavior, intestinal function, bone homeostasis, uh, metabolism, and even uh, circulation and, and vessel formation. Uh, so mostly, uh, uh, we, we want to know about how we acquire our gut microbiota. Uh, so most of the microbes are received uh, at birth. Uh, there's some debate on, in the field whether or not colonization happens in utero, um, but we can agree most of the microbes are, are received at birth. And then um, during early infancy, there's even more uh, transmission from the mom uh, from physical contact. And then as we mature, so does our, micro uh, so does our microbiota. But we know that disruptions um, during early life, either prenatal antibiotics, C-sections, uh, or antibiotics during nursing uh, on the maternal side, or antibiotic exposure of the infants directly can disrupt this normal maturation process. And there's now epidemiologic evidence and experimental evidence that altering the early life microbes can change um, immunologic development, behavior and neurobiology, and growth and metabolism. So we got really interested in microbes and obesity, and of course there was this pioneering work uh, by Peter Turnbow uh, in Jeff Gordon's lab showing that if you take microbes from an obese mouse, give it to germ-free recipients, in just two weeks there's increased um, body fat, really demonstrating that microbes can drive changes in metabolism. Um, but this model starts with a change in genetic function. And so we asked the question, can we, can we develop a model that actually starts with the microbes? So for this, we turn to the farm. We've known since about the, the late 1950s, sorry, late 1940s, if you give low-dose antibiotics to farm animals, it increases their weight gain and feed efficiency. And, um, this works across um, different uh, host species, different classes of antibiotics, but the conserved thing is that the earlier you start it, the more profound the effects. Um, so before I get into the actual data, I wanted to acknowledge the many people from NYU that were involved in these studies. Um, uh, this work was done uh, when I was a PhD student in the lab of uh, Martin Blazer. And the studies were started by, uh, by my colleague uh, Il Sung Cho, where he tested four different antibiotic regimens, uh, penicillin, vancomycin, a combination of the two, or chlorotetracycline. He started it at three weeks of age and went until just 10 weeks of age, so still a uh, fairly young adult, and found that uh, all antibiotic regimens uh, significantly increased fat mass, but it didn't change weight over time. And so this was the first evidence that we could start to reproduce um, some of the metabolic alterations we see in the model from the farm. So my first question really was, uh, can we get a bigger effect if we start earlier? So I gave low-dose penicillin uh, either at weaning or at birth, and I looked at the mice uh, well into adulthood at 20 weeks, and we saw um, a significant increase in total weight in both male and female mice, um, only if they had received the antibiotics from birth. Uh, and in males, we saw uh, increases in fat mass, 
uh, from both exposures, and even greater if they received it from birth. So this was our first evidence in our animal model that uh, younger mice are more metabolically vulnerable. We wanted to see if we could enhance the model by introducing a high-fat diet. So in this experiment, penicillin was started from birth, and we introduced high-fat diet in adulthood at 17 weeks of age. I indicate uh, the introduction of high-fat diet with the arrow here, and in male mice, you can see when we introduce the diet, there is weight gain, as expected, but when you have the combination of penicillin plus high-fat diet, there's an even greater increase in weight. And it's very little changes are happening in, in lean mass. Most of the changes are happening uh, within the fat mass compartment. Now with the females, it was even more interesting. Um, this was a 45% high fat diet. Female mice um, are reported to sort of resist weight gain on this high fat diet. And you can see, even with the introduction of just the high fat diet alone, there's really no change in weight. But when we have the microbiome disruption, suddenly you have an increase in weight gain and really profound differences within fat mass. And so this really helped our model development and showed that a combination of microbiome disruption plus, plus changes in your diet um, could lead to um, microbe-induced obesity. So we had a particular interest in early life. And in all the experiments I showed before, we were using these lifelong low doses of antibiotics. And so here, um, I exposed mice only for four weeks, eight weeks, or 28 weeks. Um, of low-dose penicillin, and this was done uh, in female mice. And what we see is that regardless of length of exposure, um, all, uh, 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 all groups have significant increases in total mass um, throughout the experiment and increases in fat mass uh, beyond 20 weeks of age. So the mice really have to grow up, their metabolisms have to slow down uh, for you to see these early life programming uh, uh, events. So we wanted to know which microbes were changing, and so we sequenced the V4 region of the 16S gene on a MySeq platform. We used Chime for down, uh, downstream analysis. And this is a PCOA plot. Each dot represents a mouse, either uh, black for control or orange on low-dose penicillin. They're uh, clustered out into 3D space. Uh, it is a significant clustering. Um, and all this tells us is that penicillin changes the microbiome. So that's really not a surprise. Um, what was a surprise to us is that when we took the mice off antibiotics, um, uh, the blue group here now goes back in clusters with control. And when we see um, at the end of the experiment at, at 28 weeks, now we have another group we've taken off antibiotics. They also cluster with control. What this means is that their microbiome has recovered. It's gone back. But um, at 28 weeks of life, they're actually uh, obese. And so this is our, our evidence that uh, there is a microbiota metabolic programming um, because the microbiota recover uh, and the mice develop the increased fat mass uh, later on in adulthood. And so these delayed effects have actually been seen in the human population. Um, there was a very uh, a tragic um, occurrence, the Dutch hunger winter, um, where there was um, a massive uh, famine in the Netherlands during World War II. Um, uh, calories were rationed down to 400 to 800 calories per day. And what they found is that the mothers that were uh, pregnant during this time, their children, uh, when they grew up to be around middle age, 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, started having increased risks of uh, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and dyslipidemia. So this idea about early life programming uh, really has been seen uh, in the human population, and our studies are, are consistent with this. Um, and so because we were a microbiology lab, we wanted to find out which microbes uh, were actually changing. So we sequenced the fecal microbiome over time. We have control mice on four, eight, or 28 weeks of low-dose penicillin. There are many changes going on, but I just want to highlight this one here, allobaculum, uh, is the bright green uh, uh, population. It's about 5% in mice fed normal chow. Then that big black line is where I introduce a high fat diet, and it really expands on a high fat diet. You can see it's depleted in early life uh, in, in all of those uh, uh, experimental groups. So, but beyond allobaculum, we wanted to look at other microbes that were changing. And in three out of three independent experiments and two out of three independent experiments, we found uh, other candidates. A, a consistent reduction in lactobacillus, consistent reduction in allobaculum, Reichenel ACA, 
and a bacteria called Candidatus arthromitis, uh, which is also known as a segmented filamentous bacteria, or SFB. So who are these microbes that we think could be important for shaping metabolic health during infancy? So lactobacillus has been studied for over 100 years. There's over 30,000 publications on it on PubMed. You can pretty much find anything with lactobacillus. Um, it's a major lactic acid producer, and it can protect from some uh, uh, intestinal pathogens. Um, Allobaculum is relatively recently described. It was first isolated from a Labrador retriever. Um, we know that it's highly uh, uh, responsive to dietary changes. Um, it's also been linked um, with uh, uh, negatively correlating with markers of inflammation and positively correlating um, with lifespan and actually some of uh, Liping Zhao's work. Um, very interesting study. Uh, right canal Asia, it's a gram negative. Um, uh, it's been long known, but very understudied. Uh, we know that it, it can adhere to epithelial cells. And then SFB, um, which can drive uh, uh, changes in intestinal immunity and, and increase Th17 cells, um, it can be uh, associated with autoimmune disease, but it can also help protect against intestinal pathogens. So these are very diverse microbes that we think uh, uh, might be impacted by early life antibiotics in our mouse model. So we wanted to then look at what was going on in the gut. So we looked uh, by histopathology, and this is uh, early life changes in ileal architecture. So in the intestine, you should have these nice long villi. This is our scoring system. And we find that mice given this low-dose penicillin have significantly increased um, villus atrophy. And this brings us to this concept that good fences make good neighbors. And if you want to have a nice, lifelong uh, relationship with your microbes, uh, you should have appropriate defenses. And so we studied a little bit further um, using some gene expression analyses. But before I get into that, I wanted to review some classical pathways in the gut. So microbes provide a variety of antigens. And those um, can be taken up and uh, presented uh, uh, to naive T cells that, are, that will trigger their differentiation. Um, those uh, differentiated T cells will secrete other cytokines that will act on effector cells, which will then uh, secrete antimicrobial peptides and can then in turn modulate the composition of the microbiome. And there's many other processes going on, but I just wanted to highlight um, this arm. And so we looked by microarray at the effect of low-dose penicillin in the gut and we see a big downregulation in immune genes. What was really surprising to us is that um, there was a, a big downregulation in antigen presentation genes. Downstream of that, um, we see decreases in Th17 cells, which are important for intestinal defense, and we also see a decrease in antimicrobial peptides. Now, this is actually consistent with several other studies in obesity in the field, uh, where basically people find that if there's this dis disruption at the intestinal interface, now this can be um, a depletion of the mucus layer or weakening of tight junctions or knockout of certain immune components like uh, the infl inflammasome or TLR5, you can get this translocation of um, bacterial products. It can alter metabolic signaling, and that can actually drive obesity uh, diabetes, and non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis. So all of the studies so far, we're relying on antibiotics. And so we wanted to see, is it the antibiotics or is it the microbes? So we performed a microbiota transplant. We selected donors, um, three control donors, three penicillin donors based on their medium, uh, median uh, weight. We purchased um, germ-free mice uh, and transferred microbes via oral gavage. And what we found is that uh, within five weeks, the mice that had received the low-dose penicillin microbes uh, had significant increases in fat mass, uh, no changes in, in lean, and also significant increases in total weight, really demonstrating that this altered microbiome was causing the changes uh, in metabolism. Beyond that, we wanted to see if we saw the same changes in the gut, and so our, our microbiota donors also had reduced Th17 cell markers and antimicrobial peptides. And our microbiota recipients showed similar trends, demonstrating that we were transferring the gut uh, immunologic phenotype as well as the metabolic phenotype. And we then looked at the microbiome 
and we saw a consistent reduction in some of our, our candidate organisms. So again, we were losing lactobacillus, we were losing alabaculum, and uh, uh, had reduced Riken LACA. From the 16S data, we also wanted to get a, a bigger insight into function. Okay, so we see names are changing, but what are they actually doing? And so we used a tool from Curtis Huttenhauer's lab. Um, it's called PyCrust, and it basically constructs um, a, a metagenome from 16S data. Then you can find out what processes they're doing. And this is a table of consistently altered keg pathways that were altered. And so we see a big down regulation in many functions related to carbohydrate metabolism, fructose, uh, glycolysis. Uh, we also see decreased um, uh, cell wall peptidoglycan biosynthesis. And then we see an upregulation in many pathways that have to do with amino acids and lipids. And so what, what this is really suggesting to us is that we didn't just change the microbes, but we changed the metabolic output of that gut microbiota. To find specific uh, uh, metabolites that were altered, uh, we also looked at um, the cecum and liver samples by NMR uh, spectroscopy. And we found many metabolites that were altered, but I wanted to highlight the ones that were consistent in our microbiota donors and our germ-free microbiota recipients. And so we saw um, significantly elevated levels of sequel ethanol. I promise I wasn't giving uh, uh, drinks to my mice, but that's what we saw. Um, but we saw most of our changes really in the liver, where we saw decreased hepatic acetate, um, decreased glutathione, and increased hepatic maltose. Now, out of all of those, what was most interesting to us is um, uh, glutathione. So glutathione is one of the major uh, antioxidants in the body. And what we found by RNA sequencing is that the enzyme that's responsible for using glutathione was significantly upregulated and the substrate was down. What this suggests to us is that there's in fact a, a elevated oxidative stress going on in the liver when we change the microbes with low-dose penicillin. So a few key aspects of this model um, of microbe-induced obesity, we do see that infancy is a critical window of host uh, microbe metabolic interaction. We see that um, a high fat diet can accentuate the effects. Uh, we see these changes uh, a reduced uh, ileal and intestinal defense. Um, and we can find uh, consistent targets that are changing over time. Now, one of the, the criticisms of this model, even though it's a way to find out which microbes can change metabolism in a host, is that it doesn't match up with what kids get. And so we, we uh, launched another study in the, the mouse work, and much of the study was pioneered by uh, Yael Nobel um, in the Blazer Lab. And this really sought to model pediatric exposures. So kids in the US, on average, by the time they are three years old, uh, have gotten uh, four courses of antibiotics. The highest rates of antibiotics uh, in the, the US population is during infancy, and the most common classes are a beta-lactam and a macrolide antibiotic. So we really sought to model that. We used a beta-lactam amoxicillin, and we used the veterinary uh, macrolide tylosin. Uh, and then we had a third group that received tylosin, amoxicillin, and then uh, tylosin again. And we looked at changes on growth rate and body composition. And what we found is that tylosin significantly increased growth rate, um, but it really had very, very little effect on body composition in this experiment. There was a little bit of elevation in lean mass early on in the study, uh, and then no changes later on. And so this is actually quite promising, like when you think about the human population. Uh, we do understand, though, that um, microbiome diversity is an important factor uh, uh, to promote health throughout life. And so we looked at the effect of this very early life antibiotic exposure on microbiome diversity over time. Uh, control is in blue. We stopped the antibiotics here at this dash line. What you can see is that um, both antibiotic, all three antibiotic groups have reduced diversity, even more so if they've received tylosin. And even 100 days after we stop the antibiotics, we still see reduced diversity. So there are lasting effects from this early life microbiota tr uh, antibiotic treatment. We also looked um, by uh, shotgun metagenomic sequencing at altered uh, metabolic pathways. And we see changes within carbohydrate central metabolism. We see increases in uh, uh, LPS uh, synthesis. And we see uh, alterations within uh, peptide transports. And so this is suggesting that 
uh, even though um, uh, uh, there wasn't really an effect on growth, we are changing the overall microbiota function. We also wanted to take a look at the effect on other metabolic diseases um, and how uh, the early life microbiome could play a role in type 1 diabetes. And these uh, studies were um, really pioneered by uh, Ali Lovanos. And so what she looked at uh, was uh, low-dose penicillin or pulsed antibiotic treatment. And what she found is that this early life treatment really had no effect in the female mice, but in male mice, uh, the pulsed antibiotic treatment significantly increased uh, diabetes rates. Uh, she next conducted the experiments um, uh, to, to try to look at reproducibility. Um, a hurricane hit NYU, we had to move all of our animals. So in a second animal facility, what was really surprising to us is all of a sudden uh, the pulsed antibiotic treatment actually made diabetes worse in female mice. And so this has been actually reported sort of throughout the literature, is that you can have variable antibiotic effects depending on where you are. And so that's a really big consideration uh, to take into account. Um, in one study, they found that vancomycin uh, improved or uh, uh, made diabetes worse. Again, we looked at the effect of this early life treatment, uh, antibiotic treatment on intestinal defense, and we saw that in the animals that had worse diabetes, a reduction in FOXP3 T regulatory cells, um, and ROR gamma uh, delta T cells, and reductions also in um, serum amyloid alpha, uh, which is uh, sort of a reactive um, antimicrobial uh, peptide. And so what we're starting to find um, from our model of pulsed antibiotic treatment um, that really mimics uh, childhood antibiotic exposures is that both, um, both a macrolide or a beta-lactam exposure can increase growth rate uh, but it doesn't seem to have lasting metabolic effects as we see with the STAT model. We do see uh, long-term changes in diversity. Uh, we do see that a macrolide has a, a much uh, more severe impact on microbiota diversity. Um, in, in the diabetes model, we see that pulsed antibiotic treatment, but not subtherapeutic antibiotic treatment, can increase diabetes incidence. Uh, and that's also tied in with the reduction of an intestinal defense. So to wrap up uh, uh, this work, uh, it's important to consider uh, the implications in the human population. Now we know that diabetes rates have been rising rapidly in the last two to three decades. But what's really striking is that if you overlay the uh, obesity map with the antibiotic map, uh, uh, it's a very striking similarity. And there can be a lot of confounders. Um, and so in order to really look at, at this in the human population, it's important to do uh, epidemiologic studies. And so uh, working with uh, Jan Bluestein and uh, Leo Trisandi at NYU, we modeled, uh, we looked at the risk of uh, uh, weight gain um, in over 10,000 children in England. And what we found is that if kids got antibiotics in the first six months of life, uh, they, were, they had a significantly elevated risk um, of having higher weight uh, later on in life. Now, we didn't find the same risk if the kids got antibiotics uh, from six months to 12 months or 12 months to 24. So it really seems to suggest that this early window is very important. Um, another source of microbiome disruption is delivery by C-section. And so consistent with that, we also see an increased risk of overweight with C-section. So beyond that, um, there are many other studies uh, that have found uh, similar findings, including um, one by uh, Megan Azad. And uh, what we see is that they most commonly find that antibiotics in uh, the first six months um, really have the most profound effect. Um, there was another interesting study where they find uh, the highest risk associated with broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, it's important to point out that these studies don't always find the same thing. So here's a cross-sectional study where overall they found increased risk of obesity in boys receiving antibiotics. Each dot represents the risk factor from a single site. What you can see is everything is very site dependent. Um, certain centers see increased risk and certain centers see decreased risk with antibiotic exposures and weight. And so the question is, how do we start to make sense of all of this? 
And so what we really need to consider is how antibiotics might affect the microbiome and the nutritional status. So uh, some very early work from Rene DuBose found that if uh, mice were on a, a protein deficient diet that had gluten as the sole protein source, and if you knocked out the, the microbes with the high dose antibiotics, they lost um, lysine and threonine as a dietary uh, nutrient that they were getting from the microbes, and they lost weight. Now, if you gave those uh, uh, lysine and threonine back, it blunted the weight loss. And if you gave a complex protein mixture, you actually got weight gain. And so this kind of goes back to what um, uh, Katie was talking about earlier. Here's a situation where it's a low battery, where you really need your microbes to contribute nutrients. And so this brings us to sort of a general concept that you can have disruptions during infancy. And those disruptions, we believe, might then potentiate the risk for altered metabolic development. And there might be cases where it leads to uh, uh, situations of being underweight or overweight. And it all happens in the context of human variability, genetic predisposition, gender, diet, physical activity. Um, and other diseases uh, uh, that humans might encounter. So just to save on time a little bit, um, I think this really brings us to a lot of translational challenges and opportunities. Um, number one, I think, is prevention, really to focus on antibiotic stewardship. Um, we know in infants the immune system is, is underdeveloped, and they can be very susceptible to infectious diseases, um, but we do understand that there could be lasting effects. Uh, so really encouraging the use of narrow-spectrum antibiotics and the judicious use. Um, I think we need more diagnostic tools to really understand which patients are at risk for a, a long-term uh, uh, microbiome involvement in a chronic disease. And I think more needs to be done to understand the key uh, microbes. Finally, uh, with treatment strategies, we really have to think about timing. So if you do need to use an antibiotic, should we be giving a microbiome restorative therapy? How soon should you give it? Uh, and, and really, uh, can we build uh, clinical evidence and guidelines to surround that? Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up, uh, since we do understand that changing early life microbes might have lasting impacts, and C-sections may be implicated in uh, perpetuating some of these long-term chronic diseases. One approach has been to transfer uh, uh, vaginal microbes to C-section-born infants. Um, studies have demonstrated that we are able to partially restore the microbiome in these colonized infants, but we really don't know the long-term effects on this. And I think that these are some of the, the questions to sort of tackle in, in our field. And with that, um, again, I'd like to acknowledge um, the big team at NYU that contributed to these studies, and thank you for your attention. Um, very nice uh, summary of a lot of really interesting work. I'm thinking about at the end when you're transitioning to, to humans, I was surprised to not see breastfeeding as part of the mix of the early life. Right. Either colonizers or moderators of the impact of, mm -hmm. um, of antibiotic prescription. So could you comment on that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, breastfeeding versus formula feeding has a big effect on the microbiome. Um, uh, breastfeeding will tend to promote uh, lactobacilli and bifidobacterium. Um, and there even appears to be a breast milk microbiome where uh, there actually is a stable colonization of microbes that can grow off of the, the lactose sugars and then be transmitted to the infant. Um, there is then a concern if you give antibiotics during breastfeeding of uh, reducing some of the uh, good microbiota that might be transferred, and on top of that, transmission of the antibiotics onto the infant. And I, I think that's a very important area to study. And in fact, I would say in uh, many of the, the studies so far, uh, it seems that breastfeeding actually has a larger effect on microbiome composition than uh, vaginal versus uh, C-section delivery, at least on the microbiome uh, once you get about a month out. Um, the very initial first day, first week, delivery mode really has a big effect on composition, and then it matters what you're feeding the child. I wonder if that, if population differences 
um, in rates of breastfeeding or duration or exclusivity of breastfeeding might explain some of the heterogeneity in that slide in, in the relationship between obesity, BMI, and prescription of antibiotics or antibiotic use. No, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, it, it definitely could play a role in the populational differences. Uh, uh, thank you. This is very interesting. Um, so I, I don't know if we need to uh, make a difference between an early antibiotic use induced adiposity and uh, a real obesity phenotype. So have you ever tested insulin resistance, leptin increase, and uh, uh, inflammation cytokines? You know. Yeah. Uh, so that's a that's a really uh, good question. So we only. When we use a normal chow diet, I would call it microbe-induced adiposity. When we use a high-fat diet, 45% um, high-fat diet, we have um, significant changes in fat mass. We have uh, insulin resistance. Um, we have significant reductions in some of the uh, digestive hormones, so reduction in peptide YY and an elevation in, uh, in, in leptin. We see no changes in uh, MCP6 or some of the other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then when we look uh, at inflammation in the liver, we actually um, see NASH, so non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So we see larger um, uh, pro-inflammatory infiltrates and, uh, and higher um, uh, uh, lipid score in the liver as well. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you uh, compared the antibiotic uh, treated early treated with non-treated, is there any difference when you add a uh, high-fat diet? Yeah, so that's correct. So those were the studies I was talking about. And actually, there's another publication that came out. Um, the first author was Doug Mahana, who looked even further at um, the liver phenotypes in no antibiotics versus uh, low-dose penicillin um, on a high-fat diet and, and really uh, explored changes in the liver with that. Yes. In the back, in the come back. Uh -huh. uh, thank you. That was very good. Um, I was particularly interested in the result when you showed that there was an increase in fecal ethanol when you gave the antibiotics on a high-fat diet. Is there any indication, or, or is this replying to perhaps measure yeasts um, of the bacteria in the feeding of, of yeast moving in the uh, it's a, a very good question about um, could it be from yeast. It is possible. We actually never did any um, 18S sequencing to find altered yeast populations. We did look at total fungal populations by 18S qPCR. We didn't see changes there. But there are also um, gut bacteria that can make ethanol as well. Um, so it could be a general diversion um, in some of the major metabolic uh, uh, end product pathways. And then in addition to ethanol, I didn't show the slide, um, uh, by GCMS, we also saw uh, elevated levels of short chain fatty acids uh, using these models. So it looks like maybe there might be a, a increased uh, microbial output of, of certain uh, metabolites. Um, very nice talk, thank you. Um, two questions. Well, first one comment, excellent question on the breastfeeding, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, I was wondering, so the Dutch hunger winter you mentioned, and I was thinking about it earlier um, during Katie's talk, and I wonder, do you know if anyone has looked at microbiome in that cohort? I don't know, and I'm not sure, at this point I'm not sure, but it would be very interesting to do. Yeah. My other question is um, around you mentioned quickly of the hurricane and changing facilities, mm -hmm. um, and that seems like an interesting like, opportunity, um, mm -hmm. devastating opportunity, I guess. But is anyone looking into why you saw differences? Like um, I, I have to go. I can email uh, Ali to see if there are changes in our sequencing data. Um, but in work that I'm currently doing that's using antibiotics in a model of multiple sclerosis, our lab moved buildings, and when we moved buildings, we have different phenotypes now, and we're definitely sequencing things. Is it the to same change. mice that like physically got moved? Like, could they be under stress from moving, or is it like no, di like different cohorts and that sort of thing? Um, but what's interesting is things can change from time to time. One of the big markers that we look for in animal facilities is segmented filamentous bacteria. It induces these Th17 cells. Some mice have it, some mice don't. But we've 
we've seen in our animal facility cyclic periods where all of a sudden we have this microbe that's really known to induce TH17 and then sometimes we don't. So there are seasonal changes um, and it's definitely worthwhile to, to sequence things over time uh, to understand how the dynamic changes. Because as a human scientist we think like, oh, in the mice, they're so lucky they can control everything. It's like this perfectly controlled <laughs> sure. experiment, and then you're like, well, maybe not. Right, and then, and also on that note, one of the, the things that people don't always look for is the level of uh, colonization um, with uh, helminths and some of the larger eukaryotic um, uh, commensals or parasites that, that we see in the animal facility, and that can make a big, a big difference as well. All right. Oh. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So um, that brings me back to the point about antibiotics doses and how they change the ecosystem. So when we do um, quantitative PCR for total microbial levels, they're at the same level. So um, using the subtherapeutic antibiotic doses, they're about 100 times lower than a therapeutic dose, and it doesn't change population number at all. Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, in agriculture, uh, at one point, probably five years ago, most of the antibiotics sold in the U.S., were sold for growth promotion in livestock. They're not sold, it doesn't, they're not delivered at a level that'll cure infections. So uh, they actually aren't at a prophylactic dose. They're even 10 times lower than a prophylactic dose. Uh, there's been a really big pushback from, initially from the FDA, but now even more so from consumers. And so now there is a voluntary withdrawal of uh, antimicrobials for growth promotion. And that's recently been implemented. Uh, so uh, it's, it's reducing in the US, but it's sort of as, as food producers decide to remove antibiotics from, from the, the food supply, uh, we will hopefully see changes. Um, another thing that, that we're interested in testing is some residual antibiotics can end up in the food supply. We really don't know whether uh, those even lower doses than we've experimented with, if those could have an impact on, uh, on the microbiota in the human population.